you know, it's easy to get apathetic. It, it's easy to feel on 18th anniversaries of this Iraq war, on 20th impending anniversaries of this version of the Afghan war that, you know, that'll be coming up. It's hard not to kind of get down. And then you see some of the impressive speakers on the panels and you think, well, you know, this, this is important. And if we're not taking action, then wouldn't that be kind of obscene? So today I'm supposed to talk about uh, Afghanistan and I will, and I will go against all proclivities and I'll be brief so that we can hopefully have some questions at the end. Uh, that being said, I think I have to say a little something about Iraq, um, a different anniversary, right? Today being the 18th since that great euphemism of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, I was in, I think, the fourth iteration of Iraqi freedom. You know, it was supposed to be, uh, you know, one and done invasion, freedom, democracy on the Tigris, and then out. And it didn't really pan out that way. But that was my first war. Uh, I was a new graduate of West Point, and and in a sense, I was like a 23, 23 year old, almost childlike voyeur to, you know, this this horror of a of a civil war that we had caused with our illegal invasion, contributed to, catalyzed, you name it. And I mean, frankly, sort of the horror and the, the futility and the farce of that 2006 to just about 2008 deployment was like a profound pivot in, in my life. Uh, in a certain sense, there's like a macabre sense of arrested development. I, I sort of stopped there, at least in certain ways. And I've seen a lot of things through that light. And I went to Afghanistan later through that lens, largely, of what I had sort of experienced and learned and, you know, thought I had learned from, uh, you know, from Iraq. Anniversaries are, are strange things. I think uh, events like this can be, can be tough. I'll admit this year has been hard on me. You know, yesterday and today, I, I've been kind of down. You know, um, I think what happens is I let like a, a sliver of a bit of sort of that fatalism I was talking about, that hopelessness in. But then you see the other people on the panel, uh, the inspiring folks that are organizing and that are speaking, and you realize it's not about me, right? It, it's sort of about the work. And the work's a lot older than any one of us, and it's going to have longevity past. And those small actions genuinely do, uh, do matter. But I'd still like to start with uh, Iraq, if no other, for no other reason than to juxtapose with Afghanistan. I think that it's instructive that my first war was and was expected to be Iraq. I, I, I think that that's interesting. You know, my class graduated 911 young officers, right, out of the academy, which is, which is fascinating, right? Because we're the class of 911 cover of Time Magazine, all of this. Uh, about 800 of those, by my best estimate, went to Iraq first, right? And expected to go to Iraq first. Back then in 2005 and six, Afghanistan was seen as like a successful war. It was the quiet war. You were lucky, right? If you got to go to Afghanistan, you probably wouldn't get yourself killed over there. This was the idea. Uh, but of course, I leave Iraq against the Iraq war. I, I, I read and I study and I experience and I see and there's a mismatch. And now I'm against the Iraq war. Um, I'm almost ready to say something about it, but I do like my socialized medicine and my military identities. So there's a lot of cowardice creeping in. So I'm, I'm more kind of acting out rather than being a public dissenter. I didn't have that courage at the time. I wish I did, but I wasn't quite over the Afghan war yet. I guess you could say that I sort of faintly bought the Obama-esque line of the good war and the bad war, right? Iraq is the bad war, but the Afghan war can be won. It has to be fought. Uh, and uh, maybe we should have given more attention to that. Maybe we should continue to give more attention and resources to it. That is not what I found. So I entered the Afghan war in the second surge. So I was lucky to make uh, both of those surges or of course not so lucky at all. I, um, I'm in the Iraq surge of 2006 and seven. I'm in the Afghan surge of 2011 and 12. What I actually found is that down in Kandahar province, sort of out in the, the rural area, which was one of the real focuses of that surge, uh, I, I lived on the on my own little Alamo, sandbagged Alamo outpost. We controlled zero square inches of territory we didn't stand on. Sometimes we'd have to jump into the canal on the outside of our gate, uh, right out the gate of our little outpost because we'd be ambushed immediately. We held nothing. Uh, there was a there was a veneer. There was a Potemkin village sort of aspect of it. We would be able to show the generals progress if we did certain things. 
but it was a it was all a fantasy. The absurdity sort of of Surge 2.0 was uh, a, a, another life changing event. It made my critique more systemic. It, it made me sort of realize the limits of American power, the limits of American force, and also the counterproductivity of it. And so, you know, when I speak about these issues, in some ways, I, I'm in, I'm invited to events partly because of the veteran status and turning against the war, but I'm really skeptical of that, of, of myself. I'm, I always want to be a, careful not to make it about, oh, we lost this many soldiers and that's the tragedy of the war. The, the real victims, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan or anybody else, are, are local people who die or killed uh, or starved in droves by you know, US policy. So I don't want to make it about that. But when we're looking at the current moment, of a president making a decision on one of the longest wars in American history, depending on how we count, right? Uh, you know, the wars against indigenous folks and then the Philippine war was long and the Iraq war and the Afghan war can be expanded into a, a broader thing since the late seventies. But nevertheless, one of the longest wars, the president currently has to decide what he's gonna do about it. So that's why I'm willing to talk a little bit about policy and the veteran experience. Uh, I was in that surge at another anniversary. I was there on September 11th, 2011. Reuters wants to do a story down in the heart of the American surge in Afghanistan for the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Now, Reuters is a slick media agency. They need a New Yorker. They need a New York City kid. And they were like, go to my brigade. And they were like, New Yorkers? No, no, all our officers are from Alabama and Montana. This is the American army, right? But they found a kid from Staten Island. They were like, well, that'll do. You know, <laughs> it's technically New York City. They sent a reporter to me, a uh, nice guy, spent like two days with me, asked me some questions. Hey, what does this have to do with 9-11? Nothing. I was pretty dark place, I'll be honest. They sent him to the wrong guy or the right guy, depending on your perspective. I told the truth. I said, farm boys with guns. I said, uh, I'm not into gimmicks. I'm not writing firehouse numbers on bullets. You know, my family are firefighters. And uh, boy, were my bosses unhappy. Oh, the colonels were just like, you couldn't just say the right thing. You had to tell the truth. And I'd say, sir, do you disagree with what I said? Well, well, no, not necessarily, but why did you say it? And I thought, wow, this really is sort of a fantasy. This is a Potemkin war. And this was 10 years ago. We're coming up on number 20 for that. Uh, and, and we have 2,500 troops in Afghanistan right now. And the discussion in establishment circles in media, among the generals, among the think tanks, all funded by the military industrial complex is this. Do we stay with those 2,500 or maybe we go to like 5,000? I mean, everyone essentially agrees we've got we've to stay, which is an interesting absurdity in and of itself, an interesting echo chamber. I was there when we had more American soldiers, more NATO soldiers, you know, than at any point in the war, 2011, early 2012. And we didn't, we didn't measurably alter anything. So my question is, you know, are we, are we staring in the face of insanity? You know, doing the same thing over and over again and, ex, you know, expecting a different result. It's really interesting reading the op-ed section of the newspapers now because all the self-styled establishment, serious people, serious people, the realists, the self-styled realists, they're now all talking precisely like the flighty fantasists that they love to decry. I mean, Admiral Stavridis just wrote a piece, keeping troops in Afghanistan makes America safer. And then he spends zero words telling us how. Zero words explaining that. But, but I'll tell you what does happen. What does happen is it tells us in his bio, unapologetically, that's my favorite part, that's most instructive. He's an operating executive consultant at the Carlisle Group and chairs the board of counselors at McClarty Associates. Well, what we know is, of course, the Kyle Carlisle Group and McClarty Associates are deeply invested in the military industrial complex. And wouldn't you know that a lot of the people on the Afghan study group, right, the Afghan group that this study group of insiders that basically just said, we have to stay. Well, sorry, we're serious people. Sir. We have to keep fighting this war forever. Man, they sit on a lot of the same boards as old Stavridis, who's the establishment's favorite faux intellectual admiral. They don't sound realistic. So as I kind of wrap up here and actually do what I promised for once, I'm left back with that question of hope and optimism about the war, uh, about activism against the war, I should say. And uh, I, I can't say that I'm optimistic about ending 
the endless wars, about reinvesting America's defense budget in human beings and working collectively to make sure that the two real threats to humanity, not Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, but nuclear catastrophe and climate catastrophe, which require collective non-military action, not jumping in our own nationalist foxholes, but working collectively. I'm not particularly optimistic on a lot of that happening, but I don't give up hope. And I think about Biden himself. Biden told Richard Holbrook, who wrote it in his diary before he died, that I'm not sending my son back over there to, you know, to do to try to change this society. Uh, it's not going to work. It won't work. When is when he was vice president? And boy, was he right. I mean, he was right. So every once in a while, Joe Biden is right. And I think and he was his gut kind of told him the right thing. Now, the question is, he may know better. Uh, certainly his gut is maybe better than his, his staff, like Jake Sullivan and these guys who just, just the dead shark eyes behind the, some of these advisors that are just insiders, political, partisan, you know, power brokers. Uh, will his gut play over those partisan political point scorings? But, you know, it doesn't even particularly just matter what Joe Biden does. That's the problem with a lot of media. So as I close, what I want to say is make no mistake. Uh, salvation, whether it's the Afghan war, which I've happened to be talking about, or, or any of these other indecencies in American foreign policy and its boomerang effect back home, any real change is coming from the grassroots. It's coming from, from activists who motivate people who don't even think of themselves as activists. It will not come from the top. Jake Sullivan won't save us. Even Joe Biden won't save us. And, and that's why I'm proud to be just the tiniest, tiniest part uh, of this. And I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak about it. If we get to do questions, I'd be so happy to answer anything on this or anything else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danny. And uh, I encourage people to check out his writings too. He's a terrific speaker, but also uh, a fantastic writer as well. Uh, speaking of which, another great writer and speaker and activist who's always been uh, one of my sheroes, Kathy Kelly is next. <laughs> 